the free market and shareholder rights. Um, what are what are the rights of shareholders, or why might we be concerned about them? Well, obviously, if you've been paying any attention to the news in the last couple of years, you know that uh, uh, both with the with the stock market itself going into the tank, and with the the, the failure of several high-profile public companies like Enron, MCI WorldCom, and so on, the uh, uh, public disgrace of accounting firms like Arthur Anderson. Uh, Everyone is concerned, uh, many people are concerned that there's something wrong with uh, uh, the corporate system uh, in, the, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Corporate scandals are in the news. Uh, politicians from all ends of the political spectrum have, have joined hands to denounce greedy corporate managers and consultants and accountants and auditors and so on as, being taken, as taking advantage of poor, gullible investors. Uh, by, by uh, creating very complex entities like Enron, by disguising financial information from investors, by misleading investors in order to generate business uh, in some other uh, uh, line of activity. For example, um, uh, uh, investment advisors giving false advice uh, in order to drum up business for, um, for, uh, uh, for one of their other activities or an auditor giving false reports about the health of a company in order to steer more business to the auditor's investment banking colleagues. Uh, This is what what folks are all concerned about. Well, um, is is there something wrong with the corporate system? Uh, Is is capitalism more generally to blame for these problems? Uh, Is the corporate structure itself specifically responsible for uh, the poor economic performance of the last couple of years? Um, do corporations take advantage of their shareholders? Is the corporate structure good for shareholders? Or more generally, is there something about the free market system that uh, causes injury to those who wish to invest in companies? Does the free market protect shareholder rights? Well, before we can answer that question specifically, uh, we need to talk a little bit about what a, corpora- what a corporation is and what it does, um, what, what possible conflicts of interest might arise between shareholders and managers who control the day-to-day operations of the company, and how uh, the the market might address these concerns, address these conflicts. And, of course, we can also address the uh, likely effects of any legislation or regulation uh, that's designed to correct corporate imbalances, such as, for example, the uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act uh, of 2002, which is supposed to address these uh, failures in the corporate, in, in the corporate sector. Um, so I, we need to begin with a little bit of background about what, where potential problems in the corporate system might arise and then how uh, uh, market mechanisms might be able to address them. Well, the basic problem of, of corporate governance, i.e. how to govern or control the behavior of those who run corporations, uh, this has been a, a, a large inter, uh, issue in the economics and business literature for um, 80 years, uh, 70 or 80 years. Um, this, this problem was, was, was discussed uh, in, in, as early as the 18th century. There was concern that those who operated joint stock companies might not act in the best interests of their investors. But, but, but this problem really came to the fore in the 1930s with the publication of a a famous book by uh, Burley and Means, uh, two New Deal uh, uh, establishment figures, uh, called The Modern Corporation and Private Property. The Modern Corporation and Private Property, published in 1932. And Burley and Means introduced uh, the the problem that has subsequently been deemed the separation of ownership and control. The separation of ownership and control, or as it's sometimes referred to, the Burley and Means problem. You see that often in the literature. What exactly was the thesis offered by Burley and Means? Well, they argued that even if it were the case that under some simpler, more primitive form of capitalism, the market would work in the sense that the market system uh, a production, uh, a, a private ownership of the means of production, and so on. 
in, in a simpler system, they conceded maybe that would be a reasonable way of, of allocating productive resources to satisfy consumer wants. But, they argued, in the modern system, under modern capitalism, writing in the 30s, this is no longer the case. Why? Well, if you have small enterprises that are owner-managed, so the capitalist and the entrepreneur and the day-to-day -day manager are the same person, you would expect that the person who makes day-to-day -day decisions about what the business will do will act in the interest of the capitalist, the owner of the firm, the same person. However, if you have a large, diffusely held or diffusely owned company, like a public corporation, right, where the owners, there are many, many owners, shareholders, each one of whom may own only a small fraction of the total ownership of the company. Right, in a case like that, they argued, well, those who control the day-to-day -day operations of the firm, the managers, the, the, the chief executive officer, for example, may have interests that are different from the interests of the shareholders. Okay, the shareholders want the company to maximize its profits. The shareholders want the maximum return on their investment. They want dividends or capital gains. But the, the, the manager may have other objectives, right? The CEO may value prestige. Uh, the CEO may value firm size. You know, everyone wants to be captain of the biggest ship. So a CEO might pursue acquisitions, let's say, to make the firm larger, even if that doesn't make the firm more profitable. Because the CEO doesn't really care about profit that much. He cares about, you know, being CEO of the biggest firm in town. That's one, one, one uh, uh, plausible scenario proposed by Burley and Means. They said, in general, those who own, uh, those, uh, sorry, in general, those who control the corporation managers may not act in the interest of those who own the corporation shareholders. There's a separation between the ownership function and the control function. Therefore, they argued, in a, in a modern capitalist economy where most of the production takes place in large corporations, firms will not behave efficiently. Right? Firms will not strive to maximize profits. Uh, firms will not... Uh, uh, the system will not lead to an allocation of the means of production that will best satisfy consumer wants. The whole profit and loss entrepreneurial system that we've been talking about this week doesn't apply, Berlin Means argued, in a case where you have corporations, where you have a separation of ownership and control. Well, there are a few points that can be made in, in this context. One is an important and I think underappreciated point that is emphasized by Rothbard in Man, Economy, and State, Namely, that uh, owners can always delegate some day-to-day -day control of resources to others. But the fact that you have the right to delegate the control of some resource indicates that you are the ultimate controller of that resource. Right? In other words, if I, if I give some discretion to my subordinate, it, do, it doesn't follow from that that my subordinate is now in charge. Okay? So, you know, it, 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 when, you're, when you're parenting, for example, as children get older, you give them more and more responsibility. You know, the kids don't have to get mom and dad's permission to do everything they want to do. They, you delegate to them the right to decide how they're going to spend part of their day. But that sure doesn't mean that they have control over it, okay? The fact that you have delegated this right indicates that you ultimately possess the right because you can always take it back, Okay? The way Rothbard puts it, he says, it's the owners who ultimately have control over who the managers will be. They can hire and fire the managers. And they decide which rights they want to delegate to the managers. Okay? And, of course, it's true that for many investors, many investors don't want to assume day-to-day -day responsibility of a company. They have other things they would rather do with their time. The opportunity cost of sticking their nose in the day-to-day -day business of affairs of, of their companies is too high, so they choose to delegate some authority to managers. In no means, by no means does that in itself imply some sort of uh, 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 conflict of interest. But we can say much more than that as well. Uh, the question is, are, are market participa participants satisfied with a situation in which corporate managers have a lot of control and owners have very little? And the, the simple answer is, no, no. 
there, there are many market mechanisms that can be used and indeed are used to limit or, con- or, 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 or uh, uh, mitigate uh, a- a- any, any conflicts associated with the separation of ownership and control. Owners, even if they do cede day-to-day operational control to managers, still have many means of limiting any discretion that the managers will have. And it's useful to, to, to separate these mechanisms into two classes, just for analytical purposes. Call them internal and external. So there's a class of internal mechanisms, market mechanisms, that are, that are potentially useful, and a class of external mechanisms, market mechanisms again, that are potentially useful. Well, some internal control or governance mechanisms include setting up a board of directors. Okay. I, as a shareholder, may not want to monitor the managers on a daily basis, but I can vote for someone who, is, who has the job of monitoring the managers closely. Right? We can vote, we can elect a board of supervisors or overseers whose job it is to control or limit managerial discretion. Of course, uh, uh, most, most uh, p- shares in public companies have voting rights accruing to them. Right? So in principle, I as a shareholder can go to the uh, annual meeting and I can, I can, uh, not only can I vote for members of the board, but I can vote on certain company policies. I can vote to kick out the existing managers and have them replaced with new managers and so on. Um, you have uh, what are called uh, proxy contests or proxy fights between, say, two rival slates of managers, each wishing to have control of the company. They, they uh, battle it out and then the shareholders vote for who they want the new managers to be. Uh, pr- proxy contests or proxy fights have some limits. Uh, uh, just if you think about problems with voting in particular, um, uh, uh, it, this may not be the cleanest or, 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 or um, uh, simplest mechanism, uh, most effective mechanism for dealing with control problems, but it, but it, is, it is possible. It is there. Um, an even more effective form of discipline for managers is performance-based compensation. In other words, if the, object, if the shareholders have some particular objective, objective X, one way to deal with manager, managerial discretion is to make the managers pay some function of X. Okay, the manager can receive a bonus that's tied to the financial performance of the firm, accounting profitability, or stock market performance, or whatever it is that the manager, uh, excuse me, that the owners value the most. Uh, the uh, uh, CEO can be paid uh, with shares of stock or options to purchase shares of stock, right? Thus helping to align the interest of the manager with the owners by making the manager an owner too, okay? That's a, that's a way of potentially dealing with, with the conflict of interest. Uh, a Chicago economist named Fama, F-A-M-A, um, wrote an influential piece on the market for managers, both internal and external to the firm, and how managers have an incentive to monitor other managers to make sure that those managers are not taking advantage of shareholders. Why? Because these other managers want to be, they want to be the manager, the top manager. Think of kind of the, uh, the, the, the John Gotti theory of control, the mafia theory, or I guess I should say the Salerno Di Lorenzo um, <laughs> approach to control. You remember, you remember John Gotti, the famous the head of the Gambino family? Well, how did John Gotti get to be the head of the Gambino family? How did he, how did he rise to that position? Yeah, he killed the previous uh, uh, head of the Gambino family. Okay, and if you're the head of a mafia family, you have to be very, very careful. We'll learn about this tonight when we watch The Godfather. <laughs> Although none of the Corleones try to kill the Don. But, um, but the point is that you, head of a mafia family, you've got to be... Uh, you've got to be careful what you do, right? Because your lieutenants are keeping an eye on you. And if you screw up, they have an incentive to try to have you replaced through one uh, 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 mechanism or another. It's the same thing in a, in a corporation, right? The number two guy is keeping an eye on the number one guy because he wants to be the number one guy. And if he can go to shareholders and say, look, the number one guy is pursuing sales maximization as opposed to profit maximization, you need to get rid of him and put me in his place. There's also the same kind of competition 
um, among the pool of managers outside the firm. Right? They're, they're, they're outsiders who are potential CEOs of your company. And they're also going to be keeping an eye on what your CEO does. Right? So it, it's kind of, uh, this is a, sort of a subset of a general class of sort of free rider situations. I won't use the word, I won't say free rider problems. When you, when, when you learn about free ridership in mainstream literature, it's always the horrible, terrible, awful free, ri- free rider problem. I say free riding is great. Right? Three cheers for free riding. Um, I, as an investor, as a, as a small shareholder, I don't have to pay super close attention to, what's go- to, to, to what the managers of my firms are doing because I know that other people have a stronger incentive to pay attention and they'll tell me. They have an incentive to tell me if they see my manager doing something wrong. I don't have to collect that information myself. An intermediary has an incentive to bring that information to me. Okay, so you don't even need you know public interest watchdog groups. You don't need consumers union type groups. All you need is purely self interested uh, 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 CEOs of other companies, for example, who have an incentive to come and tattle if they see your CEO doing something wrong. Okay, so we we can imagine a whole class of mechanisms, primarily within the firm, that help to impose some discipline on what managers can do. This is not to say that these mechanisms completely eliminate any discretion that managers might have on a day-to-day basis. The claim is not that these kind of mechanisms perfectly align the interests of managers and shareholders. It's only to say that managerial discretion or the discretion of managers to act in their own interest against the interests of shareholders is limited. It's strictly limited. Okay? And may indeed be the most feasible mechanism for dealing with Problems of managerial discretion. Okay, but there's a whole other class of mechanisms we need to talk about, what we might call external control mechanisms. Mechanisms primarily external to the firm. Well, the most obvious one is competition in the product market, in the, in the output market. Right, if I'm a shareholder of General Motors and the management of General Motors is not doing a good job, is they're pursuing their own interests, uh, at the expense of my interest, well, then GM is not going to do well in the market competition among auto uh, with other automakers. GM will perform poorly, maybe eventually go bankrupt or have to be sold off or whatever. Right. So as long as these firms are competing with other firms, the managers have an incentive not to engage in too much discretion, otherwise the firm will go belly up. There's also discipline from suppliers of capital not only shareholders, but also potentially in the U.S. and in reality in other parts of the world, you do have large institutional capitalists, such as banks, for example. Uh, in, in the Japanese system, uh, in the German system, the French system, and so on, you have you know, so-called universal banking, where banks play an important role in corporate governance, where banks can own large, uh, own large shares of, of stock, for example. Large German companies, uh, um, uh, most large German companies have as their primary shareholder a large German bank. Okay, so the bank is a, is is is, a, is a, 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 or any any large block holder is in a different position than me as a small shareholder, right? The large block holder has both the incentive and the ability to monitor the managers much more closely. Now we don't have we don't have that in the U.S. because until very recently. Um, it was illegal for banks to participate in corporate governance uh, ever since the Glass-Steagall Act, another great piece of 1930s legislation, another gift of the Roosevelt administration. Um, the, the, the federal uh, 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 regulation has created sort of an artificial separation between commercial banking activities and corporate governance or investment banking. Those r- restrictions are beginning to be repealed. Uh, but in systems that without such legal restrictions, corporate performance is actually, uh, or managerial discretion is actually quite a bit lower by some measures. There's a guy named uh, Mark Rowe, R-O-E. He's a law professor at Harvard. Um, He wrote a very um, important book called Strong Managers, Weak Owners, published in 1990. Uh, which was a comparison between the U.S., Germany, and Japan, 
where he argued that uh, uh, corporate performance in Germany and Japan was much better, other things equal, uh, than in the U.S., precisely because uh, in those systems, uh, uh, banks, can, banks can play an active role in corporate governance. He says uh, the Berlian means problem is an artificial creation of the Glass-Steagall Act and other laws that restrict what outside, large outside owners can do uh, to intervene in corporate performance. Now, but we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, okay, so we have discipline in the product market, competition in the product market, discipline from supp- suppliers of capital, but perhaps the most important and most effective form of, uh, of, con- of limiting managerial discretion is the market for corporate control, the market for the ownership of companies. Okay. There's a, a famous article by Henry Manny, who's a, a currently a law professor at George Mason, um, published in 1965 called, called Mergers in the Market for Corporate Control. Mergers in the Market for Corporate Control, uh, published in the Journal of Political Economy. A very, very important article where Manny uh, sort of uh, explained in, 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 uh, in a straightforward way exactly what happens in, 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 in a capitalist system when managers mess up. Okay, if managers systematically deviate from shareholders' wishes. The, 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 the key to understanding the Manny story is to recall that, is, is, is to see that if we're in a system where shares of stock can be bought and sold, right, I as a shareholder, I, I, the, you know, sort of the, 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 uh, the ultimate act I can take to show disapproval for the people running the firms I own, is to sell my stock. I can sell my stock. So Manny tells the story this way. He says, imagine a firm with managers who are acting in their own interest against the, the wishes of shareholders. They take actions such as consuming perks, you know, flying around in, in Lear jets and having big plush offices and huge desks and so on at the expense of profitability. What happens? Well, the profitability of the firm falls. Right? The firm performs poorly in the product market or uh, uh, not as well as it otherwise would have. Market participants see this and people begin to sell their shares. Right? Or more generally, the stock market bids down the share price of this firm. The share price of the firm will tend to fall as news is revealed to investors about the activities of these managers. Well, the fall in the stock price provides an important signal to outside Investors, uh, corporate raiders, you know, a Michael Milken type figure, a Gordon Gecko figure from, uh, you know, one of those great movies, um, a, 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 a raider, or the, the management of another firm. Right? You, you, you imagine that you're, a, you're, you're an investor. You see that here's a firm that produces what seems like a decent product. It ought to be performing fairly well, but the stock price is in the tank. Well, you have an incentive to try to acquire control of that company, reorganize the firm, kick out those poorly performing managers, install new managers, and make the firm perform better. And you, you can make money doing that, right? You can buy low and sell high. You can buy the firm on the cheap when the stock price is low. In other words, you can buy enough shares of stock to gain control uh, of the firm, kick out the bad managers, put in new managers, Watch the share price go up, and then you have an investment that's worth more than what you paid for it. That's exactly what you know, so-called raiders do. Uh, they look for undervalued, what they perceive to be undervalued shares of stock, and they, and they buy them. They try to acquire control of companies, reorganize the companies, and make them perform better. Okay? So uh, um, that w- might be an example, for example, a leveraged buyout. Right, so uh, that's what Michael Milken did in the 80s. Uh, he, uh, he raised capital by selling bonds, high-yield, high-risk bonds, which, of course, were immediately denigrated by the media as junk bonds. Okay, it was simply a different risk return, uh, a, 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 set, a different set of attributes on the risk return frontier. He raised money by borrowing, by selling bonds, used that money to acquire the shares of stock of poorly performing companies, installed his own management team, watched those companies perform better, and then and and, and made money from the deal, paying off the debt holders. Okay, that's what that's what a a buyout specialist 
an LBO artist or a corporate raider, again, to use the pejorative media term, does for a living. Um, the, uh, the, the acquirer might also be another public company, right? When, if, if the share price of company X is low, it's easier for company Y to acquire the stock of company X. You can, you can buy it on the cheap, right? So either the Michael Milken type or another public company approaches the shareholders of company X and says, look, you guys are not making any money on your investment. Your, or your shares are currently trading, say, at $10 a share. We'll give you 15 if you'll, if you'll tender your shares to us, if you'll give us your shares. That's what's, what's called a tender offer. Acquisition by tender offer is where you, you go to the shareholders and you offer to buy out their stock, ask them to tender their shares. Shareholders think, well, sure, I'd rather, I'll take $15 for this share that's only trading at 10 uh, and the, the, uh, the new owners are able to try to improve the performance of the firm, get the share price up to 15 or 20 or whatever, and they make money off the deal as well. Okay? And that's the basic mechanism uh, uh, described by Manny as a form of imposing discipline on managers. Well, it, won't, it might not surprise you to know that Manny is not the first to explain this mechanism, uh, to describe this mechanism, and, and how important it is in a market economy, we, there's an interesting passage in Mises in Human Action where he describes essentially the same thing, though without going into as much detail about the specific mechanism. Mises makes an important point about how the market for corporations, the market for the buying and selling of corporate stock, places the ultimate limits on what managers can do. Let me show you this quote. The print might be a little too small, but this is... Um, uh, 300, pages 306, 307 uh, uh, of the, in the, the uh, Scholar's Edition, the 49 edition of Human Action. He, it, Mises doesn't refer to, the, to Berlian means by name, but this is essentially what he's talking about. He says that the Berlian means doctrine, i.e. the doctrine that managers control companies at the expense of owners, disregards entirely the role that the capital and money market the stock and bond exchange, which a pertinent idiom simply calls the market, plays in the direction of corporate business. The changes in the prices of common and preferred stock and of corporate bonds are the means applied by the capitalists for the supreme control of the flow of capital. Now, here's the key section. The price structure, i.e. the stock stock prices, the price structure as determined by speculations on the capital and money markets and on the big commodity exchanges not only decides how much capital is available for the conduct of each corporation's business, it creates a state of affairs to which the managers must adjust their operations in detail. In other words, even if managers do have some latitude in how they, uh, how they manage a certain operation, they don't control how much capital is given to them to manage. Okay? It's the financial markets It's investors who decide how much capital will be allocated to each manager. And then the manager has some discretion for how he's going to use that capital, but the financial market can take that capital away if the manager doesn't use it, doesn't use it effectively. Uh, This this passage in Mises, interestingly enough, occurs... Uh, in the middle of his discussion of market socialism. And you may recall, if, if, if you've studied the history of the socialist calculation debate, Mises came up with his uh, initial thesis in the 1920s, in his 1920 article, 1922 book. And then in the 1930s, there was a vigorous debate between uh, Mises and Hayek and Lionel Robbins on the one side and a group of socialist economists on the other side. the best known of which included uh, Abba Lerner and Oscar Langa. And you may recall one of the responses to Mises was to say, well, it's, tr- it's true that uh, 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 economic calculation, some form of economic calculation is required to allocate resources efficiently, but it doesn't have to be through the real market. 
right? It can be done, this can be done with sort of a play market, what they call market socialism, or you set up kind of a pseudo market and ask managers to go through the motions, pretend that you're buying and selling and so on. We'll establish false, false prices that way, pseudo prices that way. Set up kind of, it's like, like playing Monopoly or, or Sim City or something. Okay, set up a, a simulation uh, that, that can be used to, 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 uh, to arrive at, at prices that can be used for economic calculation. Um, in, the, in the history of the calculation debate, uh, many, many students, even, even students of Austrian economics, overlooked Mises' response to the market socialists. Uh, partly because Mises' response came several years later. He responded in human action when the debate was kind of already over. His response was often overlooked, but the, the passage that I uh, uh, showed you before came in the context of his response to the market socialists. And what he said was, well, uh, even if market socialism were able to establish some kind of fake prices for consumer goods, market socialism could not possibly establish proper prices for capital goods. The reason is because a market socialist system does not have a real stock market. doesn't have a stock market, a bond market, and so on. It doesn't have financial markets. He said the real failing of socialism is that it doesn't have financial markets. Socialist systems don't have financial markets. Why? Well, what, what is it that the financial markets do in a capitalist economy? Right? It's hired managers who decide exactly how resources will be used on a day-to-day -day basis to produce goods and services. The question is, where do the managers get the resources they use? Where do they get the firms? Right? Who, who, who decides where a firm will be? What firms there will be? How many firms there will be? Right? How much capital will be allocated to the production of automobiles as opposed to computers? or food, or uh, electronics, or whatever. Well, in, in, a, in a market economy, in a capitalist economy, that function is performed by the capital markets. The role of the capital markets is to decide how much capital will be allocated to each branch of industry. And no market socialist proposal has a mechanism for doing that. Okay? Without a financial market, all you have is uh, 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 you have managers controlling sets of resources that are assigned to them arbitrarily by the Socialist Planning Board. Rothbard tells a story that uh, once in Mises, Mises' seminar in New York, uh, uh, s someone asked Mises, Professor Mises, we've been, we've been talking about capitalism and socialism and focusing mainly on sort of pure capitalism on the one hand and pure socialism on the other hand, but isn't it true that in reality we don't see pure capitalist economies or pure socialist economies? Right, we have a bunch of different, bunch of different mixed economies. You know, we have, we have mixed economies that are mo mostly capitalist with a fair degree of government intervention, and then we have some socialist economies that have a lot of markets in them, black markets and partial markets and pseudo markets and so on. So isn't it just kind of one big continuum can you really draw the line somewhere and say, okay, these are basically capitalist economies, even if they have intervention, and these are basically socialist economies, even if they have some markets? And everyone expected that Mises would say, well, no, it's a gray area, you know. But, but he didn't. Mises said, yes, there's one criteria that you can use to determine whether an, econ an economy is capitalist or socialist. And the criterion is, does it have a stock market? Mises said any economy with a stock market is a capitalist economy, no matter how much government intervention exists in that, in that uh, economy. Any system that does not have a stock market is socialist, is a centrally planned economy, no matter how many markets they may allow for, you know, in some sectors or for some types of goods or whatever. Okay. It's interesting to think about the, 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 the context here uh, of, of Mises' critique. Mises, Mises claims that, uh, or he objects to the fact that socialist economists, market socialists in particular, focus only on sort of the perspective of the manager. Right? The, the manager of, of the neoclassical firm, 
whose job is to decide how much output to produce on a given day. Okay, but the market socialists ignore the question of how that manager, where, where the capital comes from. Where the capital comes from. In other words, according to Mises, the key to understanding capitalism is not to look at managerial problems, but to think about capitalism and financial market entrepreneurship. It's the entrepreneurial function that drives the market economy, not the managerial function. The managerial function is secondary or subordinate to the entrepreneurial function. The capitalist entrepreneur is the driving force, not the hired manager. I've sometimes tried to conceive this problem in in modern language in terms of what what they call the principal agent problem or the principal agent theory that many of you are probably familiar with. Oftentimes, these uh, uh, corporate governance problems are, are couched in that language that the shareholders are the principal. They want certain things, certain goals achieved. They have to delegate control to their agents, managers, who will act in their own interest rather than the interest of the principal. Well, the problem with... Um, uh, uh, not only market socialism, but, but, but a lot of the agency literature, the literature on the principal agent problem, is that it focuses on the agent. You know, how does the principal get the agent to do what the principal wants? How can you use incentive pay and so on to align the agent's interests with those of the principal? Well, and that is an important problem. But the real problem that's solved in a market economy is what exactly is it the principal wants the agent to do? What should the agent be doing? What is it the principal wants? What are the principal's objectives? That problem can never be solved under a pseudo-market. Right? The principal must be a real flesh-and-blood capitalist entrepreneur who uses economic calculation, as we've discussed all week, to figure out how the structure of production ought to be aligned. Once that decision is made, the problem of how do you hire someone and get him to do what you want him to do, that's a secondary problem. That's, a, that's secondary to the real problem. Okay. How well does this market for corporate control work? How, how, how well does it work? A lot of the critics, particularly uh, critics in recent years, will say, will, will readily concede, okay, well, in principle, yeah, in principle, the takeover market should, should discipline managers, fine, but in practice, it doesn't work. It really doesn't work all that well for several, prob- several reasons. And just very, very briefly, let me outline these and describe sort of a potential response, um, which you can read about in more detail. Um, the, the, what's often called the empire-building criticism says that, well, while, while takeovers can be used to discipline the managers of the firm being taken over, Taking over another firm can itself be a kind of a perk for the managers of the, of, the, of the buying firm. In other words, some managers might like to take over other firms because it's fun, because it gives them a thrill, or because they, it gives them prestige or whatever. Okay, so isn't it the case that, that, that allowing takeovers just adds another potential avenue for managers to do things that shareholders don't want? Well, uh, I mean, this, this uh, uh, sort of uh, empire-building criticism is, is, is itself subject to the basic story outlined by Mises and Manny, namely that if a manager is doing a lot of takeovers just to increase his own control to build a bigger empire, well, then he himself is going to be subject to a takeover by another firm, right? If, his, if these takeovers are not actually improving corporate performance, he's in exactly the same position as a manager who messes up in any other way. Namely, he faces the threat of discipline from, uh, uh, in the product market from suppliers of capital from the market for corporate control. Okay, so that argument is not too compelling. Um, uh, another uh, problem that is, uh, uh, has gained a lot of attention is a, a sort of a version of the free rider problem which says, it, it goes something like this. It says, uh, it's true that uh, a raider can come in and, and try to buy out the shares, uh, get shareholders to tend to their shares and then replace the management and so on. But what if the shareholders are kind of clever, right? And the shareholders think, well, gosh, my firm's performing badly. I'm holding a share of stock that's currently only worth 15. Uh, sorry, that is currently only trading at 10. 
And here comes, the, here comes Michael Milken offering me 15 for my shares. What should I do? Well, if I'm smart, I'm thinking, hmm, what's Milken up to? Oh, well, Milken wants to buy my shares at 15. Then he's going to turn the company around and eventually have it you know, up at 20, where the shares are worth 20 a share. Then he's going to sell it off again. He's going to make a bundle of money. Hey, what I want to do is hold on to my shares and hope that enough other shareholders will tender their shares so that Milken gets control. But I get to kind of stay, go along for the ride. Right? I want a free ride on other shareholders' willingness to sell. But I'll hold on to mine. Right? The fact that a raider is interested in a firm that's currently selling at $10 a share, the fact that he's offering $15 a share tells me that he thinks it's going to be more worth more than $15 a share eventually. So why would I sell? Why wouldn't I just hold on to my shares until eventually it gets up to 20. And, and the argument goes, well, if all the shareholders are thinking this, then nobody will sell. Milken can't buy the firm at $15 a share. right? If the, if the expected post-takeover value of the firm is such that each share is worth $20, no rational, forward-looking shareholder will tender his shares for anything less than 20 Therefore, the raider's stuck. He can't do anything. And the firm just pokes along trading at $10 a share forever. I mean, that's the story. This is a story that's popular among high-level theorists, okay, among mathematical theorists. Uh, there's an article by David Sharfstein published in the 80s. I could give you the, the citation that makes this argument on theoretical grounds. Well, there's a good, there's sort of a major problem, a, a good, um, a, sort of fairly straightforward Austrian-style critique of this argument, namely that Right? I'm holding a share, the current market value of which is $10. And somebody's knocking on my door offering me 15 for it. Well, it is certainly true that the future value of this share might be 20 But, I mean, who's to say that Michael Milken's reorganization will work? Right? It's risky. I mean, that, that future post-takeover share price is uncertain. It's uncertain today. Some shareholders may prefer to take the bird in the hand rather than wait for the two in the bush. Okay, some shareholders will not want to bear the risk that maybe this thing won't work. So not all shareholders want to uh, deal with that uncertainty. Some will be happy to take the $15 today because it's a sure thing. What this, uh, the, what the, what this critique uh, uh, ignores is uncertainty. It ignores uncertainty, real uncertainty, Knightian uncertainty, as opposed to mere probabilistic risk. Okay? No one knows for sure how well this reorganization is going to work. If, if the raider is correct, if his expectations are correct, in other words, he really, can re, he really does reorganize the firm, and then uh, uh, he can sell, sell, sell the shares later for $20 a share, Right, the money that he made, the difference between the 15 per share that he paid and the 20 per share that he got, what would you call that amount of money that he made? What, what, what kind of profit? What would we call it in, in the Austrian literature? Yeah, I mean, it, it's entrepreneurial profit. Right? The raider is an entrepreneur. Hey, that, 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 that profit is an entrepreneurial gain, meaning a, a gain that's not, not certain. Okay, it's a reward to the raider for successfully anticipating what would happen. If, in fact, the, 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 the reorganization fails and you know, the firm ends up being worth $8 a share when he paid 15 then he has suffered, the raider has suffered an entrepreneurial loss. So a takeover artist is an entrepreneur in the Misesian sense who takes action in an uncertain world in anticipation of future gains that he may or may not realize. Those profits are not a sure thing. Okay. Um, okay, finally, uh, what about uh, effect, uh, 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 attempts by uh, government regulation to solve or alleviate or fix corporate control problems, to, to alleviate the Burley and, mean pro Burley and Means problem? Well, Mises makes the important point in his book, Bureaucracy. He also mentions this in Human Action, but it's in more detail in Bureaucracy, that um, a lot of these managerial problems 
are not really the result of the unhampered market economy, but rather the result of the mixed economy. The result of the mixed economy. In bureaucracy, he, sp- he specifically identifies three different areas of intervention that, make, that give managers more discretion than they otherwise would have. Mises' phrase here is, uh, he's trying to explain the rise of what he calls the, the omnipotent managerial class. The omnipotent managerial class. Okay, or what he, uh, uh, this is in the section, it's a very good section in bureaucracy where he distinguishes what he calls bureaucratic management as opposed to profit management. And then there's an abbreviated version of the same section in human action. It's very good for those of you interested in management, managerial problems. It's very insightful. Mises on management. Um, But he says bureaucratic management, i.e. the Burley and Mean sort of style of corporation, results from, uh, number one, uh, uh, taxes and regulations that distort profit signals and, and distort prices. Okay, so the, the, uh, the, the signals that we've been describing, you know, when the firm is not profitable, someone has an incentive to come and take it over or whatever. Well, in a hampered market economy, signals of profit and loss are distorted. You know, inefficient firms are propped up by subsidies and uh, high-performing firms are crippled by taxes or arbitrary intervention, whatever. So <coughs> profit signals are not, as, are not as clear. He identifies uh, laws that interfere with hiring and promotion affirmative action and minimum wage laws and so on, interferences in the market for labor that give managers more discretion than um, uh, 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 they they otherwise would have. He also includes here things like um, the need to have a a big legal staff and a big PR division, you know, to deal with bureaucrats and regulators and to put on ads to try to convince the voters not to (coughs) vote your company out of existence and that sort of thing, uh, like tobacco companies. So the need, the need to hire a lot of, you know, what we might call non-productive employees gives managers more control than they otherwise would have. It, 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 it makes it more difficult for owners to manage their operations because you have to have these big staffs of lawyers and PR people making the firm more, quote-unquote, bureaucratic in Mises' terms. He also refers to uh, uh, the, the threat of arbitrary antitrust or regulatory activity, right, which is constantly looming over the head of the entrepreneur. All of these factors make the, co- the corporation less efficient than it otherwise would be, more bureaucratic than it otherwise would be. Um, I already mentioned Mark Rowe's uh, 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 explanation of how restrictions on institutional ownership by banks, for example, uh, uh, make it more difficult for owners to control their companies. Um, anti-takeover legislation is extremely important too. Right? When the, the basic Manny mechanism that I talked about doesn't work as well if it's hard to take over a company. Right? And uh, uh, all 50 states have legislation uh, making it harder to, to do a hostile takeover uh, than it otherwise would be. You know, hostile simply means a takeover that is not agreed to by the incumbent management, as opposed to a friendly takeover where incumbent management agrees to the to the action. And again, this is sort of a media. The media like to use this sort of military terminology, you know, raiders and white knights and and hostile takeovers. It makes it sound like you know the, the 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 managers of the acquiring firm come in there with guns and you know. Swords or whatever. No, it just means that the incumbent management doesn't, they don't want to lose their jobs. They want to keep their jobs. That's where the hostility comes from. It's kind of, it's kind of a silly word. Right? But, but if it's hard to take over a company, for example, uh, virtually all states require uh, 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 the, the takeover specialist to announce his intentions ahead of time. Right? If I'm Michael Milken, I can't just go tomorrow and, off, and, and make a, a tender offer to the shareholders of Company X. I have to announce it, you know, 60 days in advance. Well, what that means, that gives the incumbent manager 60 days to figure out, a, you know, what their defense is going to be. Um, it's an early warning system for incompetent incumbent managers who, are, who might lose their jobs. It makes it much more cost, makes the takeover process much more costly. And there are other, uh, 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 other statutes and, and procedures that make it more difficult uh, to, to, to engage in a takeover, and that makes this mechanism work uh, uh, 
less well than it otherwise would. Okay. Um, finally, and then we'll stop for, for some questions. Um, you know, is the government in a position to help shareholders? Can the government require managers to disclose more information in their financial statements than they would in the absence of regulation? That's what this, some of this new, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and so on, uh, is designed to do, is to force companies to disclose more information from shareholders. Well, we're out of time, so uh, I'll just mention that this is, right, this is a subset of the general problem of, you know, sort of... Uh, what we might call government regulation of quality, safety, and so on, like OSHA and the EPA and the FDA, right? Do we need a government agency to protect shareholders from false information that companies might disclose in their annual reports? Just like we say, do we need the FDA to make sure that drug companies don't falsely advertise that their product can do X, Y, Z when it really can't? This is really the same problem. And since many of you have heard arguments already about why... Uh, why, why, why consumers don't need government agencies to do this. The same would apply here. In other words, firms have an incentive to develop a reputation for being truthful in the information they reveal. There are third-party intermediaries, watchdog agencies that will help that, that, uh, give companies this incentive and so on. I'll forget that for just a moment. Um, I'll just make a, a, a point about uh, uh, the separation of auditing and consulting, which is sort of the big issue that congressmen are talking about, that the president is talking about, uh, that you know, we ought to have a law that says that uh, a, an, an accounting firm that does auditing cannot also do consulting, because as I mentioned at the very start, because this sets up a conflict of interest where the accounting firm will, will cheat on the audit, in other words, they'll let the company get away with, they'll make the company look better than it is on the audit, Right, because they're also making money perform, providing consulting services to the same firm. Or, to put it another way, they won't report funny business on the audit because maybe it was their own consultants that told the company to do this. Okay, so those two functions can't really go together. Well, the answer to that is to say nothing pr prevents shareholders from demanding a separation between auditing and consulting if they so desire. Right? If shareholders perceive that it's in their interest to have their companies hire an auditing firm that does not also have a consulting branch, they are free to choose to express this desire in the marketplace. There's no need for a, a, a legal, legally enforced separation. Indeed, there, there might also be advantages of combining auditing and consulting, some synergies, some economies of scope, etc., and, you know, do, do those advantages outweigh the, the drawbacks of these potential conflicts of interest? Well, I mean, who's to say ex ante? Right? It's up to the participants to make that decision on a case-by-case -case basis. We can only do harm by requiring them to adopt one particular arrangement as opposed to another. 